What's up, guys? Eric here. Welcome to another episode of the Weekly Geekly Roundup, the video series where I cover a bunch of topics that I don't do in individual videos during the week. Now, you may have noticed it's Monday. It's not over the weekend. And I've been trying to do this series on either a Saturday or a Sunday. And unfortunately, on Saturday, my voice was kind of messed up midday. I didn't feel like making the video. So I'm like, I'll just do it on Sunday. I'll get it out of the way. But by Saturday evening, I got home from work and my voice was pretty much gone. As you can tell, it's still kind of bad now. So I'm going to try and limp through this video to get it out because I know that if I don't do it now, we'll be into this next week. And then I'll be doing like a double sized weekly geekly roundup. And I don't want to do that. I want to do these like once a week, um, if possible. So what we're going to be covering in this video, we have four topics. We're going to jump through those. And then of course, I'm going to do my review of this week's episode of the boys episode six. Let me see if I can find the title quickly. Boys season two, episode six is titled the bloody doors off. We're going to go over that. I'm going to review that at the end of this video. So if you want to hear my thoughts and opinions on this week's boys, that's where it's going to be. But here we go. Let's jump through some of these stories right now. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this one here and, uh, all the links to these stories will be listed in the info box below. Most of them are from deadline. I believe I tried to use deadline for the majority of these. So there you go. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Marvel movie release schedule that is absolutely ridiculous right now. Absolutely ridiculous. So I joked about it over on Twitter, many other places. I think I even talked about it in live streams. 2020, when it comes to movies is the year of pushbacks, cancellations, shifts, all kinds of problems. Everything, 2020 has canceled everything movie related pretty much with a few exceptions that we've had for VOD and limited release. Um, let's kind of read through this article here. It says, Black Widow jumps to summer 2021, spurring Marvel picks release date shift. And down here it says, while we already knew that Marvel Black Marvel's Black Widow was set to move by its far its biggest shift on Disney's theatrical calendar, calendar going, I can't even talk today, going from November 6th to May 7th, 2021. That's a complete annual delay of Black Widow from its original pre-pandemic release date of May 1st this year. Black Widow's shift kicks Marvel's Eternals from February 12th, 2021 to November 5th, 2021. 21. Now let's just Marvel's Eternals ended filming, I believe, February of this year, which means it is deep in post production. It's probably done in post production or pretty close, which means it's just sitting around waiting to come out. Now, the weird thing for me is this movie, the, the Black Widow movie, I didn't think it would have a big impact on any of the current Marvel films, like the stuff that's going to be connected to the next phase. I thought Black Widow was going to be like its own like sort of independent story with characters that are going to be kind of contained to Black Widow. But this makes me wonder now, like, is Black Widow more important uh, as a film to the franchise than I actually anticipated? Because this move is a little bit weird. And we go on here, it goes, uh, it kicks the Eternals to November 5th and moves Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings from May 7th to July 9th. So Shang-Chi is seeing a very short shuffle, very short shuffle, not very much for Shang-Chi at all, but the Eternals, it's a pretty big shift and they really, really want this Black Widow movie to go to theaters. So I, so my thoughts on this are, I don't see any of these or any of these three movies making the kind of money that Marvel and Disney probably want them to make. I'll say any tentpole franchise that, looks at that billion dollar mark. That's where they want to get to or close to that as possible. I don't see anything in 2021 reaching a billion dollars for a couple of reasons. Probably the biggest one is going to be the apprehension of people who want to go back to theaters and get back into that life of watching movies and theaters with other people. I don't think that that's going to happen as quickly as a lot of these companies would like. So they're not going to see a big return on investment for that. I mean, I think that these Marvel movies will definitely make back their money, but I think the concept of pushing them back because you want to make a billion dollars off of these films, I don't think that's going to happen. Now, the other reason for that is probably because everything that's being shifted from 2020 to 2021 is going to make 2021 a year of like just movie overload. We're going to have so many movies so close together that everyone and, and what's the economy going to be like? How much expendable money 
our family is going to have next year after everything that's happened this year. I'm going to say right now, we think that money is a, is an issue. Now it's going to be even a bigger problem next year. There's tons of things that are going to happen financially next year. That's going to really make it difficult for people to go out and just spend money on movies. So they're going to have to be very finicky and very frugal and pick what they want to see. And a lot of these movies are going to be close together. So it's a flip of the coin to see what movie people are going to go see in theaters. So I think this shift is pretty substantial. I think it's also something that is kind of pointless. I think by now it's pretty obvious that anything over the next 12 months, maybe even next year, year and a half, you could say, they're going to need a companion VOD release. I know these companies don't want to hear it. Disney doesn't want to hear it. These these other places don't want to hear it. But I don't think we're going to see the kind of money that they want to see without doing a companion VOD release. There's just no way. Either like maybe four weeks out after it comes out of theaters, throw it up on VOD, um, you know, make it available for people who are in areas with theaters that aren't available for them, make that on VOD. I just don't, guys, I don't know. This is a mess. I think even more so than TV production, movie production has just been affected in a way where it's not the filming that's the issue anymore. It's the distribution of the movies. Like, how do we get them out to people, make them feel safe, going back to theaters and watching movies, make the kind of money that they want to make off of these movies and still keep that level of quality up there. I foresee we're going to, we're going to see a shift in movies for short term, maybe long term, where they're going to have to either be companion pieces on VOD or they're going to go straight to streaming services. We might see the budgets drop a little bit. Maybe movies will do something like a four part mini series instead of a full fledged film. Maybe we'll see more stuff coming to like Disney plus HBO max. I just don't see that, that delaying them this much is going to make that much of a difference financially. We'll see. But we'll, you know, by January, February of next year, we'll know whether or not the theaters are going to be able to accommodate any of the concerns of cons- uh, the consumers and customers for this. Let's jump into the next story. Okay, so this next story is one that I honestly did not see coming at all, and that is that Samuel L. Jackson is set to reprise Nick Fury role in Marvel series in the works at Disney Plus. Now, the story here says that Disney Plus is developing a new Marvel series with Samuel L. Jackson attached to reprise his role of Nick Fury. Sources confirmed a deadline. The project is in its early stages and details are being kept under wraps. But we're told Kyle Bradstreet, Mr. Robot, will write and executive produce and Marvel Studios will produce. If the, pro- if the project is ordered a series, it would be Jackson's first series regular television role. Jackson signed a nine-film contract to portray Nick Fury in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. His first appearance as the character came in 2008's Iron Man. He has appeared in multiple films since, most recently in Spider-Man Far From Home, Avengers Endgame, and Captain Marvel. He's also recurred as the character at ABC's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So this is kind of interesting to me. It says that it would be his first, like, TV thing, but I would say that streaming services have blurred the lines between what is television and what is film. It's a gray area for me because traditional television for me is like network television. Streaming services, although they do have television shows, I still feel like they're not quite the same as like watching something on ABC, NBC, Fox. I feel like it's a very different thing. And since Disney Plus has also said that it's committed to making its, uh, you know, it shows on its service the same quality and connected to the movies in a way that they've never done before. I would say that it's also safe to say that continuing that role into the series is just going to be a branch off of what we had in the films already. Now, one thing I've seen floating around is a lot of people have not been able to nail down what the series would be. Is it going to be a Nick Fury series kind of focusing on him as a character, following him around, doing things with him, you know, as this character in the world Or is it going to be a Nick Fury series where he's the lead in the series and it follows other agents and other characters around with him being like the primary character? Because I'll be honest, I don't really know how you'd make a Nick Fury show just about Nick Fury. Unless it's a very, very, very tiny, constrained script where it's just one story spaced out over like eight episodes. And it really is more of a dialed down MCU like film MCU series where the characters aren't doing these big larger than life moments. So a lot of people are saying maybe it's a sword series is, you know, is Quake going to show up or we're going to see Chloe Bennett on the show. I really don't know how it's going to work or how it's going to function. 
another thing is m they keep announcing these shows and we haven't even received our first official like live action MCU series on Disney Plus. And this is like since launch. One of the reasons I got Disney Plus was to get these Marvel shows, like the What Ifs, the WandaVision, the Falcon and Winter Soldier, all these shows that we were promised, the Loki series. We have not seen anything on Disney Plus in terms of original MCU content. So I'm a little bit frustrated that we're still announcing new shows and new series, and we haven't even seen any of the other shows yet. And I'm not even talking about dealing with the pandemic. A lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, because of the pandemic, pandemic, this pandemic, that. There were delays in the Marvel shows before the pandemic was even a thing. Plus, the What If series is something that can be done without any live action filming. And that's still not available yet. And that's What If. So it's not even directly connected. It's just these independent stories based on things in the MCU if they happen differently. And that's still not even available. So I'm a little bit frustrated. I still, you know, I'm, I'm at my breaking point. I'm not there yet. I'm like right on the precipice of that breaking point where I'm just kind of fed up with, with all of this. Like, let's keep announcing stuff, but not releasing it. It sort of reminds me of when uh, DC had like 20 films announced and only three of them came out. Like, I just, I don't like it. I think it's kind of, it's kind of frustrating as a fan. It's kind of frustrating as somebody that likes these projects and all these properties when you hear all these announcements and nothing has happened yet. Plus, as a subscriber to Disney+, Plus, I feel like Marvel is the forgotten property. We really haven't seen a lot of Marvel on there. And I'm sure a big chunk of people that, that have Disney+, Plus have it because of the Marvel. So bring us some good stuff. I'm okay with this. I, I, we'll have to wait and see what it's going to be about. I'm very curious. Speaking of the shared universe and DC, we got some interesting news that there's going to be a spinoff companion series to the Suicide Squad, the James Gunn sequel reboot to the Suicide Squad with John Cena, which is, this is kind of interesting. Uh, it says here, the Suicide Squad TV spinoff Peacemaker starring John Cena from James Gunn ordered by HBO Max. So it says here, HBO Max has called it called in the Peacemaker ordering a TV spinoff of the James Gunn upcoming Suicide Squad movie starring John Cena. The streamer has handed Peacemaker an eight-episode straight-to-series order for the first season, with the Suicide Squad director writing all the episodes and directing a number of them. The show will explore the origins of the character that Cena plays in the 2021 movie. It marks the latest major DC Comics orig original on HBO Max and comes after the service revealed it was making a spinoff of the Matt Reeves upcoming Batman film. DC Universe originals such as Doom Patrol, Harley Quinn, Titan, Swamp Thing, Stargirl, and Young Justice also recently moved to the digital service. So, I mean, this is just a, this is exactly what I think everybody's going to be seeing or we're going to be doing a lot of is these companion pieces to these like premiere services. So, HBO Max is to DC what Disney Plus is to Marvel. We are going to be getting a, another show, obviously, the Matt Reeves connected Gotham series. And now we're getting this Peacemaker series with John Cena. It's a weird character to sort of, you know, put as a independent series, especially considering we don't really know a lot about this, but this does show a couple things. Number one, it means that Warner brothers has faith in James Gunn. They really like what they're seeing with this film. So they're like, Hey, we really like this. We think it's going to be a big thing. Let's go ahead and do this Peacemaker series. John Cena, obviously very much on board with this. I'm sure he jumped at the opportunity to be part of this um, series and this umbrella of D DC films. So uh, it's also eight episodes, which is reminiscent of the eight episode model that I think they're going to be using with the DC or with the Marvel shows on Disney+. Plus. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe those were slated to be eight episodes. Maybe they've changed that. I think the, the initial news was eight. So it does sound to me like they're, they are kind of trying to you know do these companion piece shows and keep it connected to the movie universe. Now, the difference between DC and Marvel is DC is still committed to the independent DC shows, the ones that are not connected to their, you know, their films. You got the stuff on the Arrowverse. You've got some of these other outlying shows that I still think, you know, they're moving along in, in, on their own and they're not connected to the movies. And I think they're okay with that, but we are going to be seeing more of these companion pieces. I wish Marvel would have allowed the TV division to continue, but they want to do their own thing on the Disney Plus service. I get it. 
Are you excited about a Peacemaker series? Is this something you're going to tune in for? It's such an odd choice for a series. Um, I don't know. Maybe it'll be great. Okay, let's talk about some somewhat controversial news. This was very controversial over the last few days. We have our Hawkman for the DC film universe. And um, yeah, let's go ahead and just jump on this. Twitter was going crazy over this. Black Adam, Aldous Hodge, uh, joining Dwayne Johnson's DC movie as Hawkman. This is our Hawkman, Aldous Hodge. Deadlines confirmed that Aldous Hodge is in talks to join the new line DC's Black Adam as Hawkman. I don't think this article has been updated. I think it's confirmed now that he is going to be in the role. Uh, Hodge joins Dwayne Johnson, who stars as a titular anti-hero in the latter's first superhero ro role. Hodge will play Hawkman, a.k.a. Carter Hall, a member of the Justice Society. It was previously announced that Noah Centian Cent Centineo... Every time I read that, I can never get that right. Centineo, Noah Centineo is playing Adam Smasher. The movie is cleared to shoot in Georgia next year. Hodge recently appeared in the pre-pandemic hit, The Invisible Man, and is starring in Regina King's feature directorial debut, One Night in Miami, which, received, which recently premiered at Venice and played Tiff to rave reviews with a 99% fresh. All right, let's talk about this. First of all, I'm a huge fan of Aldous Hodge. I love the series Leverage which ran from, I believe, around 2008 to 2011, 2012. He played a character named Hardison. He was easily one of the best characters on the show. Um, and I've loved him in everything I've seen him in since then. So he's an actor who I really enjoy. And I have like almost no issues with this at all. I think my only issue is I want to make sure they get the character right in terms of like the story and, and making it good for the film universe. As far as Aldous Hodge, I really like him as an actor. And I don't really... I, I guess there's some people who have these this huge problem with the changing of characters from comics to like TVs and, and movies and stuff like that. I think a lot of times it really just comes down to, I guess, what you're looking for in a character. And for me, someone who just cares about like the story of Hawkman and how they're going to do it in the film universe, I'm pretty much okay with just about anybody playing the role. He's a reincarnated character. I just don't see an issue with that. I know a lot of people are upset. They wanted to see something more akin to what we saw on Smallville, um, the, the failed Arrowverse version, which I don't think anybody really liked. So they wanted to see something like that in the film universe. I just, I, I'm not outraged by this at all. It's absolutely fine with me. So I'm excited to see him join the film universe. But look, I want to know what you guys think about this because this is a highly controversial thing. It really is. So in the comment section down below, I want you guys to talk about this. Try and keep it as above board as possible. I don't want it to like, you know, break down into a bunch of name calling and stuff like that. But I really want to know what you guys think and why you're not happy about this change. It is a shift from what we've traditionally seen in the comics, but I'm I'm okay with this. But I want to know what you think. Go down in the comment section below and let me know. Let's talk about the boys. Wait a second. Before I give my thoughts about this week's episode of the boys, it's time to give a shout out to my team, Eric members. This is for you guys. Thank you guys so much for being continued supporters of the channel. It means a lot. And if you're interested in having your name on that list somewhere, then check out the join button, check out the benefits of being a member of team Eric and see if it works for you. Thanks again for being a supporter of team Eric. I really appreciate it. Okay. It's time to talk about this week's episode of the boys. It's season two, episode six titled the bloody doors off. What a crazy episode this week. I'm going to be using coming soon.net as my guide for this as we run through this episode. So we had the Sage Grove Center incident. Annie got Frenchie to remove her tracking chip, which was awful. Like that was just such a bloody scene. The boys is so violent. I mean, I guess that's the point. I catch a lot of flack for saying that, but it is such a violent series. Uh, she gave them a lead from Stormfront's emails, Sage Grove Center, Frenchie, Kamiko, and Mother's Milk broke into the facility with Annie's help, posed as nurses, which by the way, I thought was very risky. 
Um, however, a super nurse working there recognized Frenchie. He was Lamplighter, who had killed Mallory's children. Lamplighter explained that Vaught was trying to stabilize Compound V for use on adults. During their fracas, the suit patients broke out of their cells. So this was a crazy scene. I was really, really excited when I saw that we were going to get new super villains, superheroes, super characters. Uh, Lamplighter seems like a version of Pyro. I know that they say he's supposed to be an allegory for Green Lantern, I believe. That's his role on the series. But he's got this ability to control fire and manipulate fire, but it seems like he has to actually have a source of fire to control it, which is very reminiscent of Pyro from Marvel. But I do believe they said he's supposed to be like a Green Lantern character. And of course, we all know him as Iceman from the X-Men films. So it's kind of funny seeing him go from an ice character to a fire character and living in this world. And um, I don't know how I feel about him. I mean, every character on the series has issues. All of them do. So for me, I don't know how I feel about what he did and what happened with him. I mean, he did awful things, but everybody on the show pretty much does awful things. So I guess we'll have to wait and see where we go with that. We also met Cindy, who can either has like a really powerful version of telekinesis or she can manipulate mass and like crush things. She's really powerful. And we see Stormfront go after her and knocks her out with her electricity. But then we see that she's okay. And she's on the run, I guess. And so what are we going to have with this character? She seems to be very, very, very powerful. So it's kind of wild um, what we've got going on there uh, on the series. Let's go on here. It says, throughout the episode, we saw flashbacks of Mallory's recruitment of Frenchie, whose real name was Sergey. Three years later, he tailed Lamplighter to a movie premiere, but left to save his friend. Jay, who had overdosed because if he, he left, Frenchie was unable to stop Lamplighter from torching Mallory's bed where he hadn't known her children were sleeping. Lamplighter was regretful and wanted Mallory to kill him. But now knowing the story, Frenchie urged Mallory to spare him. So yeah, that was the whole story with Mallory. Uh, Stand your ground. One of the escape soups come across Butcher, Annie, and Huey outside. He released a pulse that flipped the van, which by the way, very cool power. Um, but obviously he was unstable. So, you know, uh, Huey was seriously wounded and Annie and Butcher needed to get him to the hospital. Annie stopped a car. The man inside pulled a gun on them when he saw Butcher's gun. Uh, when placating him didn't work, Annie used her powers against him and killed him. This was awful. I could see in her eyes that she was very upset about what had happened. But again, it's the boys universe. Bad stuff is going to happen and you know, just the way it is. Uh, they got Huey to a hospital. He was going to be all right. Butcher and Annie bonded over their love and fondness for Huey, who they agreed was too good for them. So one of the things we we're dealing with in this episode that they didn't mention in that little, that brief recap is that Annie and Butcher just are like oil and what is it? Vinegar, water, whatever that saying is. They don't mix. They don't mix. That's the thing. And so seeing them try to work this out throughout everything that was going on was pretty interesting. It was probably one of my favorite parts of the episode because we know that Butcher is just very rough around the edges and, you know, we still, he's a tough nut to crack and I don't even know if he's cracked yet for anybody, but he did seem to lean a little bit, a little bit into Annie and, um, you know, felt a little bit better about having her around, I guess. Anyway, it was a cool part of the episode and, uh, yeah, let's, uh, continue on here. It says, uh, the 20 minutes here, Homelander urged Stormfront to come back to his trailer for a surprise. That was, I, I was like, what is the surprise when he said that? I'm like, what is, what does he have in here? Is it just a dirty surprise or what? He had gotten her a bouquet of flowers, which by the way, that did surprise me. That would have been a total surprise. Stormfront told him she'd be back in 20 minutes after a meeting at Vought Tower. Instead, she arrived at Sage Grove Center to the aftermath of the breakout. Because of that, she arrived back to set late. Homelander had set fire to his trailer when she had come back and he confronted her knowing that she wasn't at Vought Tower. So when I saw that happen, I was like, this is crazy, right? Like all the destruction and damage that he did because she didn't come back. So early on, before the season even started, they had said they wanted Stormfront to be this character who was equal in power to Homelander, but was able to also manipulate him in, in ways and, and sort of make him feel bad because, you know, he's a guy and then you got this girl and she's everything that he hates and, and, you know, women, strong, independent female characters. So I didn't expect it to go this far. And I thought it was kind of fun watching him have a temper tantrum. We all know that Homelander is just prone to things like this, but then seeing this happen and, and how he reacted was just absolutely crazy. 
Um, Stormfront showed Homelander some photos of her. She was born in Germany in 1919. She was Frederick Vaught's first success with Compound V. The true mission of Vaught was to breed an army of superhumans to further the goal of ism and supremacy. I'm not going to say because I don't want this video to get suppressed. You can see it there. We know what, what it is. We know what's going on with her. And there we go. Uh, leverage. The Deep brought Maeve a camera from the crash site in the ocean. Alina found Maeve's phone connected to it. There's a video of Homelander and Maeve abandoning the plane and its passengers. Maeve uh, explained to Alina that she was going to use the video as leverage so that Homelander would leave them alone. So that was um, from the first season. And I remember that scene and being just shocked. That was back when we were still learning just how awful some of these characters were uh, if we hadn't read the comics. And so seeing that happen and seeing it come back uh, in this episode to me was like, oh, okay, we're calling back to that. And so Maeve is one of the characters where I feel like she's probably, in terms of good and bad on the boys, she's leaning more in the side of good. Um, but there you could see that her girlfriend was doubting everything, it seems. So we had that. We had the reveal of, of Stormfront coming clean to Homelander and including him in her evil diabolical plans. Uh, so here we are. We're on, we've are we got both feet on the ground and we're running straight ahead with the series. And so this was one of my favorite episodes of the season. I think there's a, a stupid fly in here. I think <laughs> the series is really finding its stride. There's a lot of people questioning whether or not the season is as good as season one, because season one was phenomenal. But I think this episode just continues to push forward with the strength of the show. And that is just the absolute absurdity of some of the powers of these characters. And we had one character who had a power... Um, that that was like a snake that was connected to um or like a I don't know if it was a snake but it was a certain part of his anatomy, and that was a really funny scene. So we have these characters with some of these outrageous powers, and it looks like that's what we're dealing with on the show. And so I'm really happy to see that's the direction we're going in with the series. And so I really enjoyed this episode. I can't wait to see what comes next. I would give this one an eight out of ten. I feel like it's one of the strongest episodes for me this season. So absolutely enjoyed it, and can't wait to see what comes next but look those are just my thoughts and opinions now it's time for you guys to sound off in the comment section down below let me know about all of these things what do you think about the marvel movie slate what do you think about all those delays what do you think about the nick fury shield uh well i don't know if it's gonna be a shield series but the nick fury series coming to disney plus are you excited for it are you just ready for anything related to marvel to actually come to disney plus what do you think about the casting of aldis hodge as hawkman are you happy about it you're not happy about it what do you think about the peacemaker series and what are your thoughts on this week's episode of the boys let me know all of that down in the comment section below with that being said that's it i'm out of here if you're new to the channel hit subscribe become part of the eric verse it's a lot of fun over here hit the team eric button or the join button to become part of team eric get some cool badges uh emojis custom stuff you can do things in the live stream you can see content that's not on my main channel all of that good stuff leave a like if you enjoyed this video it's free and it helps the channel grow and um leave a comment that's about it Thank you for checking out the Weekly Geekly podcast, Roundup, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> whatever I want to call it. I don't even know yet. I'm still losing my voice. I'll see you guys in the next video. Take care.